Let it be known, every episode you see on this channel ain't gonna be about jail and gangs and guns and the streets and thugs. Some episodes is just gonna be about life and special people that need to be remembered. You understand what I'm saying? Sometimes it's just gonna be a story out the book of somebody's life. You heard? It's millions of great untold stories out there about great people that if we don't document their lives, they may not be remembered correctly. You understand? Shout out to the whole Baltimore. Shout out to Dr. Toons. And shout out to everybody out there trying to do something artistic. It takes bravery to be an artist. It takes courage to put your art out there for the world to see. So shout out to all those living that life. You heard? Comment gang, tear this up. You heard I need about 200 on this in the first hour. And that's a fact. Z-Man, Suicide Polo with the Ski Man. You heard? Brownsville, Brooklyn, Dykeman, 200 block. Let's get it. She would take me to Bro Brownsville. Brownsville was turned up. I was walking down picking the Ave one time, right? And she was. She used to tell me, I used to. I would walk down the street. She would. I would be walking around it. She'd be like, Nah, 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 nah. Walk through them niggas. You with me? <laughs> you with me? I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> shit. So I'll be walking through the niggas with her, right? <laughs> yep, we met in Baltimore. That's where she was living at when we met. And um, yeah, I met her when she came out of chemo. She had just lost her hair. I complimented her haircut and she was like, nah, I just came out of chemo. But I thought that meant her cancer was cured. You mm. know, I didn't know that that was just, you know, that it could come back. So we was together and um, our first conversation was based on music because that same day when we met, when I met her with, the, with her hair short cut, you know, her hair low because of the chemo, I was listening to, me, listening to some headphones and I asked her, what you know about this? And I put my headphones on her ears and she started saying the lyrics to Bucktown by Smith & Wesson, right? Mm. Then that's when I found out that she was from, I said, how you know that? She said, because I'm from Brooklyn. I'm like, oh, okay, all right. So then, as I'm as as we're talking, um, I'm telling her that all my favorite rappers was from Brooklyn, and I'm you know going over lyrics, and we're just talking about music, right? But she gets into this into telling me not to idolize these rappers, right? Then she starts. Then when I start mentioning MCs from Brooklyn, I go for Wu Tang Clan and um, Biggie. She 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 said. Them, them niggas was like our sons. I'm like, what are you talking about, right? So, time time goes on. Like we, I was we were that day when we met. We was waiting for a shuttle to go up to work. We worked work at the retirement center. She was a nurse there, a geriatric nursing assist, assistant there. Right? So every day we would miss the um, shuttle on purpose and just go to work, just walk to work together right we just I, we'd be talking about music again i would show her my black book because i was an artist i wrote i'm still an artist she said biggie and them biggie and them was like her sons what you meant by that though like sons like a mother figure to them or you mean like just like my bros i think on some street shit she was saying that them, she was kind of sunning them niggas like like she was on another level compared to them mm. that's what i think you know what I mean? Real arrogant like. You know what I'm saying? Because I was I was into the music, right? Just talking about all these and all these rappers, you like 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 their life, like into their stories and all that, right? And she was trying to kill my dream with that shit. That's what I really felt like she was doing. Like not don't idolize these rappers, right? That's how she was talking to me, right? So um but no disrespect. This is what I'm trying. This is it. she also got into the fact that um when she especially Biggie right she said she used to call him Fat Chris right and this is when he was like 14 or 15 
She said she remembers him being in the back of being in the back of the car that her and her man Jay was in, and he would be he would be rhyming all the time. Some and even when he was on the street, he'd be every time he was around him, he would be rhyming. Rolled over Tim's white T-shirt, you know, spit on. She's just be real descriptive about how he didn't give a fuck. It would just be about rhyming, right? And she was like, if you want to do it, that's how you gotta that's how you gotta be, right? So. You know, she she really had a lot of love for, for um, Biggie, but she always called him Fat Chris. Yep. And um, so that's why I, that's why I gotta um figure out how I'm gonna tell you this story because it the way she would tell me was in little hints. You know what I mean? She wouldn't really tell me exactly what she was doing. You see what I'm saying? So hold on. So you met her that day when she was coming out of chemo. Y'all exchanged, y'all talked about music. She knew the words to Bucktown. Um, how did y'all start messing with each other though? Like, okay, well, well, look, we we actually met waiting on a shuttle bus. We, we were waiting for a shuttle bus on our way to this retirement center we worked at. She had just come out, come out of chemo a week before, maybe a week or two before. That's what she told me, and she, you know, had just got out of chemo when I complimented her short haircut. You know what I mean? You lose when you when you go through chemo, you lose your hair. You know, mm-hmm. so that's 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 how we met. So it, it wasn't you know that she had told me about the chemo. Just us walking to work every every day. You know, talking about the music and stuff. She she said, oh, so when I was where I was working at at the retirement center, I was working on a television screen, right? I was working on um, a news station, like an in-house television station there, where I would read the menu to the elderly people and she would see me on the television screen and one day she wrote a letter to me and she has, had wrote in this letter that she had seen she was really descriptive talking about how she seen a guy on the screen and saw the innocence in his eyes and all of this shit and I was like smiling just looking at her like <laughs> you know what I'm saying and then one day um, I asked her if she smoked weed she was like yeah she smoked right so I just I would bring weed up and then we would be smoking after work um after before she got off she got she used to get off from work around 12 and um so i would go on my lunch break and smoke with her before she left right and um eventually i came by her house and um no we went we went on a date we went on a date to see maxi priest and at the end of the maxi priest show i went back to her house and you know and it, you know <laughs> we did what we did or whatever you know but yeah, but she was always now. But the thing was, she was always telling me stories about Brooklyn, about you know, um, being in the Bronx when hip hop started. She was a child that was going from from Brooklyn back over to the Bronx. She had a babysitter named Fat Sharon. She used to go by a, um, a group. She used, to, she used to have a group called um, Cheap Achieve Crew, and she was the lead MC, MC Apple C. And I know you probably heard this before. But she was from she she was living in Marlboro Projects and she used to say her their little chant was, um, Sheba Sheba, y'all, well I'm a Libra, y'all, and my name is MC Appleseed, something something like that. I forgot the rest. But I was like when she told me that, I'm like, oh shit, that's what that's what um Wyclef and them was singing. And Mona Lisa. If you ever heard that, you know what I'm saying? At the end of the joint. Of course. But um she was a Libra? Yeah, October third, nineteen sixty six. Mm. Yep, yep. She was a Libra horse, just like my fourteen year old daughter's mother. Like her Chinese, if she was born in sixty six, that means she was born in the year of the horse. So she was a Libra horse, just like my kid's mother. That's crazy. Okay. Yeah, and I'm and I was born in seventy eight, so she was twelve years older than me. You a Libra horse? You a horse too? If you was, that's the year of the horse too, seventy eight. Oh, okay. I'm Sagittarius. Yeah, so you was a Sag horse and she was a Libra horse. I was horsed out. That's what up. Ah, okay, okay. That's what's up. Yeah, man. Yeah. So you said you heard her saying that chant and she was telling you what? Yeah, so um, you know, when I was I would I would talk about the history of hip hop and how I how I would analyze, you know, why I like why I listen to the rappers and what I was See, I had an aunt that worked for BET, and I used to record videos since I was like, since I was like nine years old, and she used to just give me all the all the video playlists on Rap City, and I, I would study videos like um, 
like it kind of remind me of comic books because you know how comic books connect i used to look at rap videos like oh shit they connect mcs would be in different mcs videos some of the scenes would be the same then you know you usually when you when a new mc would come out they would be with somebody you know what i mean like for example red man kind of coming under coming through epmd you know what i mean or whoever would come they would come through different groups and then next you know the next rapper will come right so that's how I, I was trying to tell her. I didn't really idolize these rappers, but this is what I wanted to do. I was, I, I had knowledge of self. I wanted to, you know, put a comic book together to kind of explain how we had this way of connecting our doors. So this is why she started to tell me, nah, you need to get this story straight. I was in the Bronx when they was doing that shit. You know what I'm saying? And she was, she was breaking down how, you know, she would call, she would talk about the Peace Guards doing their thing on one, one side, how her, she, where she was at with her um, cousin Kenny, who was a DJ, who also used to be her protector when she would go visit her um, aunt, her her um, her friend, her, what's it, what's it, her babysitter. Not really her blood cousin, but she used to call him cousin Kenny because everybody that that was at Fat Sharon's house in the Bronx was like family to her. Mm. So they was all you know, they all had the same babysitter or whatever in the Bronx. So, but when she was over there, he was a DJ. You know, he was also, he would, he would also beat niggas up. They tried to fuck with her, shit like that, you know? And, um, and, um, I'll tell you this too. When I mentioned Bambada in them, as far as the history of hip hop, she was like, I don't know what them niggas was doing over there. And I'll leave it at that. You know what I'm saying? Because she didn't fuck with that shit. She didn't really like that I would talk about hip hop so much. She was more just into to the fact that they was just children doing their thing. It was trying to come up, but then she would, she told me when crack hit, she seen her cousin Kenny get strung out. She seen a lot of dudes get strung out, a lot of brothers get strung out to the point where she had got married and she had a husband too who got strung out. He was into breakdancing and everything. He got strung out. And then one day he overdosed. And when that happened, that's when she decided that she was going to get in the game and start selling that shit. Heavy. So... You know, and um, this is when she started getting back into, you know, Fat Chris coming up. And um, she was talking about one day how she was sitting in her window and she had seen this guy coming through her projects. He was a boxer. He was just beating niggas up on his way through. What, right? pro what projects you said she was from? Now, this is the thing. I know she lived in Marlboro Projects at one time. Um... I'm trying to think. I don't know if she was in Marlboro Projects still at this part. I know she was in Marlboro Projects when she won that talent show when she was still an MC dealing with, you know, MC Apple C, right? I don't know where she was at when um when she was, when Jane was coming. So through. you said one day she said she seen somebody coming through a project? Who? This guy, now his name is right? Call him right? Um, um, and he was a boxer and um, she was telling me how eventually like he was taking over spots from Brownsville to Bed-Stuy somehow they linked up you know I can't remember everything I'm trying to do the best I can with this but somehow she just I just remember her telling me stories about shootouts um, being in the shootout one time with her, she was with her, you know, when they were together, she was on his side of the shootouts and they were shooting at niggas and she would wrap them up because she was a nurse at that time. She would be wrapping up their arms, you know what I mean? But if they got hit and then doing whatever, you know, they would still be shooting or whatever. A lot of stories she would be telling me, right? But then she got into the story one time how she was, um, that's that, that, he, he was at a dice game. Somewhere in Brooklyn, I don't know exactly where it is. At a dice game, they got into an argument, and she, she she got a call to meet him in the subway underground, where he when she got down there, he was completely his shirt his shirt was completely bloody. She had taken the shirt and did whatever, and and he had to go ahead. He had to find somewhere to lay low, so he stayed at her house. And this is the time period that, but she was telling me how when he was in the house laying low after that incident happened, that it was like, because he wasn't out there, 
he was talking to her like, you know, like trying to be on some do my wife shit, make my dinner type shit. You know what I mean? Or this type of shit, getting on her, getting on her nerves. Right. So one day they get into this argument, and somehow while they in the argument, he, he the mattress gets moved or somehow they lift the mattress up, and she's telling me how he saw all this money under the mattress, right? And he's like, "What the what the fuck are you doing?" And you know, she just left it like that. Then it's another story when he's you said the money was under her mattress, like under her, under mattress? her mattress. Yeah, under her mattress. And other than, that was her money. Yeah, that was her money. She didn't get into too much more detail than that with me. She was just like, you know, that was her money. Now, now keep this in mind too, right? We was together for only a year and two months. That's it. But the thing was, when we were together, she would take me to Brooklyn. And sometimes, you know, me being from Baltimore, they were shooting a wire around that time. And, um take me to Brook Brownsville. Brownsville was turned up. I was walking down picking Ave one time, right? And she was she used to tell me, I used to I would walk down the street, she would I would be walking around me. She'd be like, nah, 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 nah. Walk through them niggas. You with me. <laughs> you with me. I'm like, oh okay, <laughs> shit. So I'll be walking through the niggas with her, right? <laughs> you know, she would she would I'll be like, I would look at it and I would ask her things. She'd be like, I'm home. I told you I'm home. Like one time, one time I went to this store and I wanted to get this jacket. She's like, you got it, get the jacket. I'm like, I knew how much money we came to Brooklyn with, you know, and how much money we was working with. So I'm like, we don't even got the money for this. She said, I told you I'm home. She went to the to the lady, to whoever was working at the cash register, said whatever, we left with the jacket. That was it, you know, love, I don't, you know, whatever it was. So. You know, these are the things that was happening that I was just, you know, you know, looking at her like, who are you? You know what I'm saying? Like, okay, there was a story where she remembers being in the house. Biggie, with Fat Chris, he was on the phone talking, to, but he was crying. And he was like, you're, you're like a father to me. I'm gonna make sure you get your money, right? And, you know, whatever, he was looking for Big. She, he, he couldn't find him, you know? Um, so they would, every once in a while when they was out there, they would, he, would, he, would, he would have his eye on the street looking, looking for Big. One day, she was in the car with, and seeing Big on the corner. And he came out, he walked towards the car and was like, is that your queen? Look up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane. I'm about to do a joint with Mary J. And then next thing you know, he disappeared into the crowd. So, oh shit. But then, when um was getting on her nerves, she had kicked out the house. As soon as she kicked out the house, not too much longer, he got caught and got locked up. But as time went on, Big ended up blowing up. He met her in the back of a boat dagger, gave her some money to take care of the shit with And that was that, with that situation. She had did whatever, made sure she got that money or whatever. Um. Do you know you if know, he's still alive or not? Nah, last time I talked to or I talked to him. Um, When she passed, well, I didn't talk to him. I wrote, I wrote him and he wrote me back. He was in Greenhaven. And um, I sent the letter back to him, but they sent it back to me. So I don't know if he, you know, I don't know why they sent it back to me or whatever, but he was um, he was also in touch with her mother for a little while after that. Then she lost him. So I don't know. I, I, since probably like 2006, <laughs> so Jody passed away in 2000. We was in touch. I heard, I was hearing about from her mother till about 2006 and then after a while he wasn't writing her anymore or calling her anymore either you know and now you know since the internet's out and doing what it's doing now I, I be trying to find them but I can't find them no type of you know and I be googling it searching I don't know you know I know he was a boxer too in Brownsville so I'll be going to I don't know what boxing gym he was in I seen pictures with his with his, um, you know, her and him with gold chains on, counting money, 
know what I'm saying? Um, also, pictures of him with his boxing shit on, you know? When Jody passed away, she came, her mother came in the house, got all them pictures, and just, you know, was real sacred about keeping them. You know, I don't know if her mom knew what Jody was doing. I don't, I don't think so. So when did you, when, like, she never told you straight up, yo, this is what I do, like, she just was secretive about everything? Yeah, yeah, she was secretive about everything, yeah. She said I was too innocent to talk too much. <laughs> You know, I was too innocent and talk too much. You know what I mean? Just being young, you know what I mean? So she was trying to protect me. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. She was just really protective of me. You know, so I wouldn't... I don't know, man. It was just so crazy because I remember right before she passed away, we was in the hospital. And we had... <laughs> in the room, in the hospital room, right? In the bathroom, right? <laughs> And she said, I gave you everything. But when she looked at me, it was like, was it, it was more than the sex she was talking about. You know what I'm saying? She's like, I gave you everything. Like, she's like, she was almost like she was telling me the stories, these stories for a reason. Cause she felt like her cancer was karma for all the lives that she fucked up, knowing better. Because, you know, coming, doing, being part of that little movement with doing both big movement that we call hip hop today you know she felt like she she had did wrong by allowing what happened to her husband or whatever to make her want to become into the get into the game like that you know she felt like that what was you her say, what, what you said what happened to her husband her husband od'd off a crack yeah her cousin her, her, her um her husband's name was um kenny too just like her um her her cousin Kenny in the Bronx. Their both names was both their names was Kenny. You say he died. He, he died smoking crack. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And they were still married when he died. She was a widow. Yep. Yeah, mm hmm. Yep. Yeah. Him and his best friend Ski was in this project building, and they they were smoking together. Yep. Yeah, and he died. And you OD. said. And where was he from? The he same was from project. He was from Brooklyn. I don't know exactly which projects he was from. Well, you know, when she was growing up, she was from Sheepshead Bay. I know that for sure. I don't know what projects in Sheepshead Bay. Mm -hmm. But she was. It's Marlboro, Marlboro Projects. That's not in Sheepshead Bay, right? That's in Best Style, right? Yeah, it's in Bensonhurst. Right, right, right. Okay. Because she, when she wrote my, in my black book, she wrote Apple C.I., Best Style, and the Millennia. I remember her writing that. But when she was when she was growing up, she was in Sheepshead Bay, and I think she met her husband when she was younger in Sheepshead Bay area. You know, this is like early, you know, when the late seventies, early eighties when they met. So they grew up as friends, and then eventually got married, had a son. So you never you never actually saw her with no drugs. No, she was completely out the game. But matter of fact, she left Brooklyn and came to Baltimore. To get away from all of that shit. Oh, so she wasn't hustling no more when she was with you? At all. No, no, no. She, matter of fact, her son was in a Catholic school down there. She was trying to go to school for nursing to get her um, to be a registered nurse. She was a geriatric nursing assistant when I met her. And she was dealing with the fact that she had just had cancer because of the, the you know, the bad karma of doing all that shit. So she was on a spiritual level talking about, you know, karma and all that, trying to get away from all of that. You know what I'm saying? Actually, I think something might have happened in Brooklyn. I don't know. Something might have happened up there where she just, I don't know, didn't want, to, didn't want no parts with it. I remember one time she talked about getting a chain snatched. Some shit happened. You know? Um, I don't know, man. I don't know. Yeah. But she was completely on a different track. As a matter of fact, it was funny. It was crazy because I remember we was in a hospital right before she passed away. I had, um, I, I used to write my last name Tyson. My last name is Tyson, you know, like Mike. And um, I used to write it backwards. That was my little tag. And I just created this this tag called Dr. Tunes. And, and I wanted it to match her tag, Apple C. So I remember I was right, we were right together in Baltimore, tagging up little spots or whatever when we was coming through. And one day she told me, one day we at the top of the hospital. Um, we had to, we on the 13th floor, the top floor in the hospital. And we looking, 
we, we, we go into the bathroom, the, the ladies' room, hot box the bathroom. This is late at night when she's on chemo, when she's she's going through chemo again while we together, right? I'm taking care of her. I stop working. I stop, I mean, I stop working at Charlestown. I get another job. You know, I'm, I'm just, I'm, and I'm working at a school at this time, just trying to help her, you know, get through her chemo. So while we're up on the 13th floor, I'm like, look, I want to do this art thing. You know, um, I got this new name I made up. You know, um, you'll be all right. She was like, nah, she had a dream that she passed that she passed away. She said, if, if my mom, if, if you see my mother on, if, you, if I'm on life support and you see my mother, if you see the doctor come in and ask my mother, do she want to keep me on life support? And my mother says, no, know that I'm not dead. Know that I'm not no longer in my body anymore. I'm gone. I'm like, nah, nah, I'm praying you be all right. But then one day I go to work, I get this call that she's in ICU. So I rush to ICU, go down to ICU. I touch her hand. She's just laying on the bed. I remember her squeezing my hand and then I just, she just let it go. And then they move her body to the next room, to another place in ICU, in ICU. And they ask her mother, do they want to keep her, does she want to keep her on life support? She says, no. I hear this voice in my head to say, I told you I'm not dead. And I'm just, I'm just like, oh shit, I'm fucked up. Matter of fact, everything that she told me in the dream was like deja vu. And she was almost, it almost felt like I was remembering what she was saying. And I just left the room. And I was bumping into her aunts asking me how she's doing up there. I'm like, I'm like, I couldn't even talk to them. I'm like, what the fuck? She's gone, you know? But this is October 23rd, 2000. They actually pronounced it there October 24th, 2000. I always say she died on the 23rd because of that, you know? So, and, um, you know, ever since then, I, I would just be in Baltimore. I would just go around Baltimore and, and go to rec centers. And, well, I went down to the mayor, mayor's office with my artwork. All the artwork that we that we drew together, well, that I drew listening to our stories, all the little codes or whatever we used to write. And, and I would just try to tell the youth about music and about art and how to use it to, you know, try to, I just try to give them something positive to feed off of, you know, based on what she told me. And I would just share my story, you know, being with her and how much she changed my life, just being who she was, you know, and how much I learned being with her, you know? And so, yeah, it's, and there's this more, you know, I got lots of work. I'm about to do a big art show right now. Well, I'm trying to get this big art show done, you know. It's a lot of things that are going on on that level. But it's all, she's like my, she's like my foundation, man, you know. And um, when I saw you doing the stories on, Brooklyn, on, um, on lots of shit that was going on in Brooklyn, I'm like, yo, I, it's gaps in, in, in her story. I, I just wanted to, I'm, I always wanted to just put it out there to see who would approach me, who would fill it in, especially with the cheaper cheaper y'all part, you know? So basically, she she told you some stuff, but she kept a lot of stuff from you also, and you feel like you still got a lot of unanswered questions about who she was in her past life before she met you? Did she tell you enough stuff to know about, to get a general idea of who she was in her past life? She told me enough. I, I I think she told me enough, you know, um, because I think she knows she knows she knew what I needed to do what I wanted to do as far as with my art and my you know she I think she loved me on on that level you know like she really cared about me just having what I needed to make a difference an impact you know with my art. But on another level, some of the shit I went through was so quote-unquote magical you know what i'm saying like a part of me just be like god damn like who this shit this was, this was a year and two months that just went by what type of oh, stuff y'all did in that in that within that year and two months like what type of stuff she told you like what type of shit you learned from her like what's what's the most memorable shit things that she told you never take any shorts um walk through niggas like, oh, she used to talk to me about Brooklyn slang, real heavy. Matter of fact, she used to say, um, 
she didn't like when no, she didn't like people saying kid. She didn't like that, you know. Um, she also used to. She didn't say beef. She used to say riff. She didn't talk of. You know how you know Stetson Sardin had the song talking all that jazz. She used to use jazz slang. When she talked about this. Yeah, you said she was born in '66, so she was a little. She was a. She was kind of a little bit. Uh, that's a few generations before us, man. So you know they slang this on that extra throwback Brooklyn shit, like you said. That's a Sonic type vibes. Right, right. As a matter of fact, she would also talk about a lot of that shit with hip hop started in Brooklyn. Everything was Brooklyn. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Everything. Like she wasn't getting into the Bronx narrative of it like that you know what i'm saying matter of fact she would say that shit was a fairy tale the way they told it the way they tell hip-hop you said hip-hop was more she usually talked about black movements you understand you know what i'm saying like different things black people was trying to do and how djs was all across new york you know um they had the Harlem renaissance but then they had the brooklyn renaissance you know just the type of stuff she was telling me just a lot of she had a lot of knowledge on um on history you know being that she was a little older than you know so and we was listening to biggie we was listening to bootcamp i was i would take my time i would go through all the brooklyn mcs and just listen to the listen to their slang and listen to certain things and it seemed like the elders was watching the youth somehow like she was the elder watching the youth and biggie was like the youth you know, and I was, she used to call me her youth, you know, and that's, I had this, this program that I started called Us Youths, because she wrote it down, you wow, she, she was West Indian? Nah, but you know, being from Brooklyn and all that's there, you know, so she could speak Patois fluently, she would, you know, she get around Jamaicans and West Indians, she just blend right on in, you know, but then, nah, but, but see, her mother was, um, her mother was from Maryland, actually, Annapolis, and her, um, father was puerto rican she didn't remember her father um her father was probably in her life till about three years old so she barely remembers what he looked like but you know that that's her background but she and, and also she she stopped listening to hip-hop when crack hit too you know what i'm saying she started listening to nothing but roots and reggae and all of that so that was her vibe when, when we met she was always going to dance hall. We was always going to dance hall shows together and stuff like that. Like, like I said, Maxi Priest was our first date. But we we would go to D.C. and go to other shows, you know, Buju Bantan. You know, we went to the Red Rat and Goofy show, you know. Um, there was a store, a spot called Gentleman 10, where we used to go to in Baltimore, you know. Also, I remember when we was filming The Wire. When, well, not we was filming The Wire. When they was filming The Wire. We used to always go to this weed spot in Baltimore, and um, and and she would teach me how to read the streets, you know, because she was so keen on knowing how people was moving, you know. That's what she would. That's 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 one of the things she would also teach me. What you mean, like she? What she was saying? Them dudes on the street is the lookouts. That right there, they the one serving. Um. You know, they, these, the police, one time she knew the police was about to raid the store. So she was like, hold on, get out. She said, um, I'm about to get out the car and go into the store. I'm like, hold on, the police want to raid the store. She said, I got it. She came, I seen her go into the store. The police come out the car, go raid the store. Then the police leave. Then she come out smiling. I'm like, what happened in there? She said, well, as soon as she got into the store, she told all the dudes, all the boys, the police is coming, give me your weed. They put all the weed inside of her. She went and buy, got a bag of chips, opened up the bag of chips, put all the boys' weed in the bag of chips, put it inside the little turnstile, you know, the little, um, the glass, you know how the corner store, they got the glass windows up with the little thing you put your money in or whatever, right? She put the money and the bag of chips with the weed in there, paid for it, turned it around, got her hands, put her hands up so the police could search her and all the boys. They didn't find nothing on them. They left. She got she got her change back, took out the chips, took out the bag of weed from the chips, back from the chip bag, gave them to the boys, gave them to the boys that were selling the weed out there. And then that was it. And every time we went to that weed spot, they would show us love after that. So <laughs> matter of fact, I just did a comic book. 
and I put that little scene in the book. But I put the rap snack chips, chips there instead of the um the Rio bag. You know, I'm trying to put black businesses together. You know, Master P on the rap snacks or whatever. So yeah, I did this whole comic book. She plays the character in there. So you do you doing a comic book based on her? Yeah. So I did a comic book based on us, um, as a people. You know, just like you have Wakanda. Um, in the Black Panther movie, I said, I, right, I made a place called Negloria. And that pretty much is just how niggas communicate from what they call the plantation era up to now. But I say Negloria was before what they call slavery or whatever. We was already here on this side of the planet with our culture. So, you know, that's part of the stuff that she was, you know, talk to me about too. You know, all the break dance and all that stuff. All them was tribal dances and stuff. You know what I'm saying? The way, you know, the writings on the wall, all of that. So when um I did the sto- I did the first book called The Legend of the Black Face Joker Nigga, a painting the Gloria. Where I get the black ink thrown on my face, but when I get the black ink thrown on my face, it was given to me through her. And a couple of other people, you know, I, I went when I went to art school. I went um I went to a high school in Baltimore. My art teacher, her father, happened to be the guy who drew the Black Panther, um, drew for Black Panther, the actual comic book. His name was Gene Colan. So I met him after um after high school, when my art teacher connected me with him. So you know, that's when I decided I wanted to make this place called the Gloria. You know, based on like I said, how um. How when we listen to our music, we listen to hip hop, and even before that, you know, listening to um, Delphonic, Stylistics, my parents' mu- music, I would listen to the slang. La la means I love you. So that was the code. You know what I'm saying? Um, one nation under groove. One nation. Pac said one nation. You know what I'm saying? I always looked at Digital Underground like the Digital Underground Railroad. You know, I worked with. Matter of fact, I worked with Layla Steinberg, who found Pac and introduced him to Shot G. In 2010, as an artist, I was drawing sto- a storyboard for this project called Mike Sessions, where I learned a lot about what Pac was trying to do on that level. You know, so I would connect. It was, I, I mean, I don't want to be on no spooky shit, but I always felt like she was a spiritual guide for me or some ancestral shit after she passed. Ever since she had that dream, I would just take my, my pen and put it to the paper. I even been I even bumped into a few psychics who read me and said that there's a woman and they broke it down and I was like, oh shit, that's you know, they said her. This is a spirit that's around me. You know? So well, you know the world is spiritual, man. You know, we be all fools to believe that this shit is just some big accident. You feel what I'm saying? We'll be a fool to think life is just some big accident and we just this shit is all for nothing, like We'll be fools to believe that, man. All of this shit is connected. Everything is written in the book of life. And those that you meet in life that uh, mean the most to you, even in passing, they'll, they'll be the catalyst to make you go do some shit that you wouldn't have did if you wouldn't have never bumped into those people. You feel me? Now, I mean, okay. we all know my bro Murder that I was doing this channel with. Now, I mean, son passed away. We did a story. We did our last story. He went to sleep that night and never woke up the next morning. You feel what I'm saying? And that shit, that shit tore me apart. But then, you know, the guard, my bro Wise, he was like, yo, man, you know, son is gone. But now we could tap into his power. You feel me? Right. Now he's now he's in the universe. We could always tap into his spirit. You feel me? And that shit was deep, bro. So basically, that's what you're doing. You tapping into her spirit and you're doing something with it. Exactly, G. See, I I live this, G. Like, but I can't. Sometimes I got to watch who I'm talking to. You know what I mean? But something is telling me that it's all right to talk to you, man. I don't know why. But something just told me it's all right to talk to you, G. I don't question when I get that that little intuition. You know what I'm saying? So, and what you said, yeah, tapping into our power, that's exactly what I feel like I'm doing. I did the whole soundtrack called The Legend of the Black Face Joker Nigga with 10 joints, you know, and um, I did a song called Joe Stairs for Jody, you know, instead of Joker. That's not, that's not no, I'm not J O K E R, I'm J O K A H, the car, the soul. If you know, you know what I'm saying? If you don't, dealing with the, um, the comedic. You know what I'm saying? They say the car is the is the soul body that separates from the physical. 
So when I spell Joe, that's Jody, and I add the car to that, that's Joe Ka, you know? But I'm like, yeah, you know, Joe stands for Jody. Y'all niggas don't know me. You know what I'm saying? And I just, that's the legend of the Blackface Joker. I'm spitting the gems that I need so that we don't be on no goddamn cool shit right now in the public, playing ourselves, killing each other on the record. You know what I'm saying? I, I, you know, I'm, I just, I just think that 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 we got to take this this thing to the next level of consciousness as far as our youth is concerned. You know, because I'm I'm tired of seeing that. Um, I'm tired of see other seeing other people profit from our talents and allowing and, and picking the ones who um p- picking putting money behind those who have the negative message out there, as if there's not elders and youth. That have more to say That know exactly what you're talking about Tapping into the power of those that pass away That, that, that write and create from a deeper A deeper place You know Yeah bro yeah. Those are all facts I This mean, is what bro. I used to go tell the youth man When I used to go to the rec centers You know You know the youth man the youth, the youth is crazy man Because you know it takes some time to get mature and get wise, man. You feel what I'm saying? And a lot of dudes, man, you know, they just gotta, they just gotta live. They gotta go through what they gotta go through in order to get, in order to become, you know, the person that you really need to be. It's a shame it gotta be that way, but you know, dudes be having to go to jail two and three times and get shot up and all of that shit to finally see the light. When if they just look around them. The light is there. You feel what I'm saying? Like, yeah. the right move is there for you to make. But you know how I be, bro. These dudes, these dudes is young, man. I try not to yeah. preach to dudes too much. I try, I try to just drop my little jewels and try not to preach to these dudes too much because when you preaching to these dudes too much, they really don't want to hear you. You understand right. what I'm saying? It's like you just gotta do what you do. But um, yeah, man. <laughs> but um. Well, you know what? Um, when you when you say that, see, when I when when she first passed away, I would go to the rec centers, do a little talking to the youth or whatever. But it got to a point where I was just on that all the time. Like, so even when I was away from the rec center centers, if I seen youth on the bus or whatever talking crazy in front of the elders, I would stop them, correct them, respect your elders or whatever, do whatever. You know, I, I'd be on the bus, you know, just or moving in different hoods because I, I started doing murals in Baltimore. And when I would go, I would actually go to certain areas that was a lot of abandoned buildings. And I would try to get them to move money over there to let me put murals in that area when I used to work for the mural program. You know what I'm saying? And um, and eventually I got to this point where well, I met this, 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 old, this elder was watching me talk to the youth one day. And he was like, why you keep talking to the youth and not leaving them with something? So that's when I sat back and was like, okay, I'm going to do this book called Hood Instructions. So in the Hood Instructions book, I had um, I had Jody on the cover of the one that was to the mothers. I didn't want to say to the fathers, one to the mothers and one to the children. And to the mothers had Jody's face on there, you know, and um, in the book was codes and stuff. So every time I would be out at the mural site painting them to paint in my mural, I always would put little codes on the wall and either give either give a book to the youth or I would be selling the books for five hours, you know. So we and I would go to Kinko's. I knew somebody that was working at Kinko's that would just run off copies of the books for me for free, just because he seen me out. He knew what I was doing. So you mm. know, and around Baltimore, a lot of people they know of Apple and shit. Even me, I was surprised one time. I'm you know, ten years. I've been, I've been doing that shit since two thousand. Well, two thousand she passed away. Two thousand um, by two thousand seven. No, by 2010, I'm doing the hood instruction books, right? With the blackface joker in there, right? So by that time, I'm um, I'm I had put so much shit out there between the rec centers, seeing youth growing up. You know what I mean? That one time I'm walking down the street and this guy is at the um, I'm in the store and he just puts his hand out and just shows me love. I'm like, yo. I'm Doc Toons or something. I say to him, he says, "I know you were you a legend, G." I'm like, what you talking about? But then I had to think about it. All that all that shit, 
You know, it's, it's, it's respect, man. The youth started giving me respect, man. Like, not even the youth no more. Like I said, between 2000 and 2010, that's a good 10 years. So youth that was like 8, 9, 10, it was 18, 19. You know what I'm saying? Grown up, remembering me, though. I look the same to them. Mm-hmm. They look different to me, though. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, but the thing was, they kept being like, why are you still here? Why are you still here looking like that, running around the city? So I just came to Miami about a year and a half ago. And I started really trying to push this art and take this narrative on a higher level with Negloria. I met a model, I met a woman down here who became a model for the face of Negloria, like Columbia Pictures. You know, in the dream, her and Apple connected together. And well, in the story, The Legend of Black Face Joker is a dream that I drew, pretty much. Taking a collection of all these dreams and then putting it together, call it The Legend of the Black Face Joker, which is two books and the 10 songs for the soundtrack. Now I'm actually working on a story called The Gloria with me in Miami and her son, Justin. You know, Jody's son, Justin, is in the story. And, you know, I'm letting all she, our children. She got, a son, she, got a son that you, she got a son that you stay in contact with? Yeah, yeah, her son, Justin. He was six years younger than me, and she was 12 years older than me. So, you know, when she passed away, it was just me and him in the house for a minute. And then, you know, his, her aunt, her sister moved in, his aunt. And her mother came down from Brooklyn and moved down to Maryland and then took took it from there and then I moved out. You said he yeah. was only six years younger than you? Yeah, only six years younger than me. So yeah. she she had him when she was mad young? Um oh uh, not mad young. She was probably like maybe nineteen, twenty. She was married, you know, to the to the you know, she was married to his father when he OD. You know, mm-hmm. and um, her son remembers seeing him. Matter of fact, that that's that's the boy that's in the Bronx Tale. When I did you see where I circled that little picture? Yeah, yeah, that's that's her son, and that's Jay's son, Jay's real son, next to him, in the jumping on the mattress. Mm-hmm. You know, Robert De Niro came to her house and shook her hand and asked, could he use her house for that scene for the Bronx Tale? And asked could her son play in that scene. So she kept opening up the win- opening up the window, looking at her son, making sure he was all right. They kept she kept fucking up the shots. You know what I mean? They had to do it over and over again. Stop looking out the window. You know what I mean? He good. So that's that's um that's her son right there. Yeah. Matter mm-hmm. of fact, the thing about her son that's so ill though is she was telling me how when he was like three years old, her and her husband was at this. Um, video game convention in, Man- in Manhattan, and they lost their son in the crowd, right? And they what they's doing, what they was doing there, just introduced Super Mario Three to the public. So everybody's playing Super Mario Brothers Three, competing, trying to win this contest, and they lost their son. And the next thing you know, the winner of the contest appears on the screen, and they see her three-year-old son reaching up to the arcade, you know, to the game, <laughs> barely reaching it, killing the game. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Just beating everybody. And he was the you winner? Know, at, three years, at three years old, huh? He was the winner? He was the winner. That's how they found him. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> and the thing was, like when she got when I met him, she was so protective of him. She would she would I would stay in the basement all the time and leave out the back door. Like she didn't even want me to meet him at first. She he was in school, he was in Catholic school. He went to Mount St. Joe Catholic School in Baltimore, Maryland. Um and, and when he when she passed away, his whole thing was graduating from college like she wanted him to. So he went to Temple State University, graduated magnum cum laude in electronic engineering. And yo, just, you know, he never even had a real, he mourns in silence. But his whole thing is, is just being successful. He got his own place. He make me feel like a fucking bum. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, he really got his life in order you know what i'm saying like on the surface you know you never know what people are going through inside you know because his mother wasn't that type of woman that cried you know what i'm saying so you never i never see him shed tears you know he probably saw me shed more tears than than him you know i think i was more fucked up than him i don't know man but um yeah yeah he's he's a genius mind like that when it comes to electricity and all of that shit. That's why I wanted to put him in the comic book. You know, I put him as the underground, the, the guy who works. We go into the churches. You go underground. The Gloria is at the bottom of the churches. The churches is a mask for for what's really going on. 
know what I'm saying? And he's down there operating on the systems that control part of the television networks so that when we out there putting our music out there, there's somebody checking and balancing what should go to the streets and what should not go to the streets. So we in war with this with the machine. You know? 